All right, Seth, my man, how are we doing tonight? Doing great. How about yourself? Good. We're blessed. Um, it's it's one of my, my favorite days. We get to have a tiger on the podcast. Obviously, if you can tell from the background, um, big fan, born and raised in Memphis, um, you know, met my wife at the University of Memphis. So it's near and dear to my heart. So anytime we get a chance to talk to one of the athletes, I'm 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 all about it. So uh, but. But before we get into you um, and your story and, and kind of taking us through the journey of Seth Hennigan, man, I, I got to ask, obviously, you know, I did I did some research uh, and I found out you are a, a video game, you know, mobile game guy. However, we, we like to ask all our guests about their movie experience. So I'll ask you, man, what's your favorite sports movie? Uh, my favorite sports movie? I've got to go with The Sandlot. Solid pick, man. Solid pick. Not a football movie, a baseball movie. I like it. It's very wholesome, fun for the whole family. Um, you know, with that, obviously, those those kids in that movie have a lot of, you know, heroes growing up. Babe Ruth, obviously, being, you know, the the one depicted in the movie. But for you, man, what who is your all time favorite athlete? Um, my all time favorite athlete, I probably just have to go with Tom Brady. This is the ultimate. Oh. Leader ultimate winner you know he does whatever it takes to win games and that's what it's all about so daniel he picks my favorite movie and then goes with tom brady man ah that's i'm i'm down here in tampa and and, and that's what that's what winner winners do man they, they come down no, here so i i can feel you y- y'all fit right in together i mean he played for <laughs> memphis tom brady tampa i got you but you know what let's get into it seth you know where is it you're originally from uh, i'm from Denton, Texas. That's where I say I'm from. But I'm from a couple different areas in Texas. We bounced around a little bit growing up. What uh where would Denton be? Like what's the, the largest city is close to? I mean, it's close to Dallas, I guess, like 45 minutes away. But Denton in itself is pretty big. There's uh UNT's there. It's pretty it's kind of growing, pretty good population. So. Don't don't let me find out the trifecta. Don't let me find out you grew up Do a it. Cowboys fan too. At- no, what? You grew up a Cowboys fan, did you? Uh, no, not necessarily. No. Okay, okay. We were go- we were we were gonna go off the rails here because that's Daniel's team too, and I was gonna be like, all right, the parallels between you two is getting to be a little too much <laughs> for me. But anyways, man, growing up, you know, what were the dynamics? You got any siblings in the house? What's up? Uh, I have two brothers, one older brother and one younger brother. My older brother is two years older, and he goes to Texas University of Texas. And then my younger brother, he's five years younger than me. Uh, lefty plays quarterback as well so he, he'll be next up so needless to say you're a middle child you got two brothers there you know athletes you know how competitive was it growing up uh, it was uber competitive uh, everything we did I was always trying to outmatch my brother who's two years older than me so that helped me uh, just try to stay on par with his physical attributes but he was older than me so uh, I was trying getting beat up on and then I would just pass it down to my little brother. So it was just poor like, little brother ain't got now. nobody to pass it down to. That's messed no. up. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I see your dad was obviously your high school coach. We'll get into high school in a minute. But at what age did he really start coaching you guys? I mean, did he catch you as soon as you could start walking? Um, I mean, he really let us decide our own path, to be honest. Uh, he would always ask me if I really wanted to do this, if I really wanted to be a Division One football player. Um but it was really, I'd say, high school that he really took me under his wing and started to develop me uh, as a quarterback and as a as a person. But, like, up until then, he kind of stayed away. And my, my grandpa coached me in Little League, uh, his dad. Um, so he didn't really, like, take me under. Like, he taught me the fundamentals, and we would throw the ball around. And obviously I knew he was the head coach of a football team because I would go every single Friday. But um, in terms of, like, coaching me, he really took me in in high school. He let me decide what I wanted to do if I wanted to take this path. So most guys as athletic as you didn't only play a sport like football growing up. Did you play anything else growing up? Um, I played basketball until my sophomore year of high school. But, like, I was always I, – I broke my hand. I broke my nose. Like, I was injury prone in basketball, not football. You know, sometimes parents don't let their kids play football because they think they'll get hurt. But really, for me, I was always getting hurt playing basketball. So uh, I cut it. I cut my basketball career a little short uh, after my sophomore year of high school, though. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a little backwards for for most people. Yeah, we got a lot of guys on here. It's amazing how many guys that uh that play football on the D one level that weren't allowed to play until like high school because their parents didn't want them to get hurt. But yeah, for you, it's basketball. Could you you got a jumper at least? Uh, no, nah, not really. No. <laughs> He's honest, yeah. Daniel. We love him. All right, so you know you get to high school. Where did you go to high school at? Went to high school in Den Ryan High School. All right, so, you know, we're from Tennessee, so we hear about the Friday Night Lights in Texas. Here it's just completely different. Is everything they do and they say to hype it up, is it true? Um, I'd say yes, compared to Tennessee at least. I went to a Collierville game, and, you know, respectfully, like, it's hard to compare the two in terms of my high school. My high school was pretty prestigious, even for Texas high school. Uh, we had a lot of talent going through there, so, I mean – I think Texas yeah. football is the best football, but maybe yeah, I'm we're not gonna, we're not gonna take it personally. I mean, they don't make movies about yeah. Tennessee football. You're yeah. you're good. You can you can keep it on us. So you know, we talk about dad being your coach. You know, is it added pressure when you get to high school and you start playing football for him, or is it make it easier that it's your dad? Um, I mean, I'd say added pressure, just because people people like judge you and they think that you're the quarterback just because your dad's the coach. I got that a lot uh, in high school and as did my brother, my older brother. And so like, whenever you hear that, I mean, you take it personally and then you have to just prove yourself every single day that, you know, I'm really, I'm good at this stuff. Like I'm not here just because my dad let me be the guy I'm here because I earned it and because I'm a good football player. So, I mean, I'm sure it was added pressure for him just to know that like his son had to perform. But for me, it was the same deal. Like I knew he was my coach, but, you know, it wasn't it, – I didn't get the easy route just because he was my coach. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I mean, throwing for 7,234 yards, 79 touchdowns with just 14 picks, I think that kind of uh, verified that your dad wasn't playing a little favoritism there. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you uh, you know, you led Denton Ryan to a 39-2 and record over the, the three seasons you were there. You went to the 2019 5A Division Championship. Uh, uh, 2018, you went to the semifinals, you know. Obviously, uh, some really good seasons, some really good stats we're talking about. Uh, first, I want to start, you know, because we want to focus more on Memphis. But from high school, you know, without getting deep, you know, do you have like a favorite moment, just that standout moment from when you were playing high school football? Uh, I'd say the state championship my senior year. You know, I was leaving for college the next day and just being able to share that moment with my dad, who it was his first state championship win as a, a head coach. Um, so that was really special for me. So clearly I was going to ask what your favorite season is, but it's got to be the senior season, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man, that's pretty special getting to share it with your dad. Now you said your younger brother is two. Did You said your older brother is two years older than you. How, how much younger is your younger brother? He's five years younger than me. Okay. I was curious if he might've get to be on the team or a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, when did you get on college's radar? Cause you talked about leaving the next day, but when did you actually start getting on college's radar? and football um I got my first offer the week of the state championship game my junior year from Houston actually um but so that, that was my first offer and then my recruitment picked up my junior spring but then COVID came so uh colleges didn't really get out we didn't have a spring ball my junior year and then uh so yeah so I mean if I had a spring ball my junior year I probably might have gotten some more attention but Things worked out the way they did, but yeah, the the week of my state championship run my junior year was my first off. So kind of a double loaded question, you know. First of all, was Memphis like the only school, like not the only school that recruited you? Obviously, you just talked about Houston, but like was it the only school that you were even considering? And if so or not, you know, why Memphis? Um, I mean, there's a couple other schools, Nevada mainly and San Diego State that were good in the recruiting process and they continued to talk to me and text me and call me things of that nature to try and recruit me to their schools. But uh, Coach Silverfield is the main reason I came to Memphis. He recruited me the, the best out of high school and he talked to me the most as a head coach, trying to uh, get to know me and wanted me at Memphis. Um, but what was the second part of the question? So like, was there any other schools that you were really considering that were, you know, Maybe I, I will consider this just as much as Memphis, or was it definitely Memphis? Uh, I think it was definitely Memphis, just because 
uh, the offense, the the people, the culture. Uh, I visited Memphis and then San Diego State and Arizona. Those are the only schools that I got to go to the campus. And as soon as I got to Memphis, I committed, and it was somewhat early. But I'm I'm so I'm surprised. You know, I actually was stationed out in San Diego and was right there on the San Diego State campus. It's beautiful out there. I might have considered California just for the weather, Seth. Oh yeah, it was it was beautiful out there for sure. And in Arizona, actually, the weather was nice when I went there. But you know, the ball. I'm I'm here for the football. So <laughs> yeah. I Memphis. Seth said he would prefer his you know, his practices these days to be 99 degrees and 2000% humidity. He's, <laughs> he's just that kind of guy. Yeah. He, he, he wants it to be hard. He wants it to be harder. Exactly. Um, so, so Seth, obviously, you know, you talk about coach Silverfield and him being a contributing factor to the reason why you chose Memphis, but what, what exactly was it that he did? You said that you know, it was the things he did for you. Like, what is it that he did? Was it personal connections? Was it coming and visiting you? Was it follow-up calls? Like, what what was the one thing? I mean, I just say building that, the relationship that we had and uh, just building that trust, I guess I would say. He would call me a lot and just try and get to know me and check in on me and ask me questions to, like, test my IQ, I guess. Um, but just he would constantly be talking to me and – other schools, they didn't do that. They just lacked communication. They didn't, they didn't recruit me. They would offer me, but then nothing else. And that just kind of confused me. I'd be like, why did you offer me? But Coach Schofield and his staff, they offered me, and then they've recruited me, and they continue to recruit me. So, uh, I mean, I got to know him very well through those calls near my recruitment process. And then, I mean, our, our bond has just gotten better and better since I've got to campus. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So you obviously you you choose Memphis and you know you come in and there's a a pedigree and a lineage now and a history of uh quarterbacks. I mean, you know, you going back to Danny Wimprine all the way to you know most recent Brady White, like there's you know some some big time names, some really good record book guys that are in there was being the starting quarterback um on the table when you first came in or you know obviously there was guys like Grant Gannell those guys were there but was the talk that you're going to have a chance to be the starter or was it come in get acclimated to the system and you know and then after a year you might have a chance to start what was those conversations like uh, I mean the conversations that the coaches told me were, were that I had the potential to be the starter and had the opportunity to compete, you know, competition is always a word that's thrown around with college coaches and, you know, whether it may be true for or not, uh, that happened to be the case. And I mean, I knew in my mind, I had the opportunity to be the starter um, the whole entire time, but I didn't know Grant was coming there in the spring, to be honest. Like I thought it was just going to be me, uh, Keelan Brown and Peter Parrish. And then I don't know who else, but I mean, I wasn't thinking straight. I mean, obviously, we're going to bring more quarterbacks into the room. But uh, I felt like coming in, I had the opportunity to start, and I felt like I would be the best option. So that's just how I took it. So uh, obviously, you 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 do end up getting a chance to to be the starter. Um, you know, what is that feeling like when they go, Seth, you're the guy, you're QB1, you're going to be starting for us, you know, first game of the season. What's that like? I mean, I just try to take it day by day, everything in life, really, just try and live the day and do the best I can every single day and not think about the future, really. Um, so I just lived every single day. I practiced hard. I tried to study the playbook hard and show the coaches and show my teammates and show uh, the fans just that I'm not got, like I can do it. Like I'm going to be the guy for us. You know, Obviously, you know, you go into that first game, Nickel State, um, you got 30,000 fans at the Liberty Bowl. Um, you know, everybody's excited. Everybody's pumped up. Game one, you know, at home. Um, was was there any emotion? Was it pressure? Was there stress, anxiety? Or did you kind of push all of that to, to the side and go, you know what, this is what I prepared this whole time for was this moment? Um, I mean, I'd say, yeah, I was just like, 
I prepared for this. I'm ready for this. Uh, I've done, you know, saying I used to say, or my dad used to say in high school to our team the night before the games is the haze in the barn. Like, the work is done. It's time to, like, showcase what you've done uh, and just play freely and, you know, attack every play how you practice it a million times. So uh, I'm never too stressed or I haven't been so thus far in my career about a game. I'll just go out there and th say to myself, I've done the work and I'm prepared for this and then just try and execute the best I can. Do you feel like um, you played well in game one or do you feel like you played okay or did you play, you know, to a, to the expectation that you thought you would being, you know, the guy in game one, you know, at a new school? Um, I mean, I thought I played okay. Um, I mean, we didn't punt the ball, so we scored every single possession, but <laughs> we kicked way too many field goals over the course of the whole season. We didn't, I didn't really execute that well in the scoring area. Um, so that's one thing, like, I really – kind of focused on during spring ball and will continue to do and showcase this season is just uh, executing in the scoring zone and trying to score touchdowns and not put our field goal unit on the field. But the first game was just okay. Uh, squandered some opportunities. I was like, I was scared to run the ball, to be honest, at the beginning of the season. So, I mean, I did okay. Daniel, I'll be honest. I mean, you know, obviously, because Daniel obviously told you he stays in Tampa. I stay – um, in mm -hmm. South Haven. So I got the Memphis radio and, you know, a, a lot of the local radio shows didn't know what to expect from you. And, you know, you say it could have been better game one and it can always be better. It's always room for improvement, but they were very pleased. I remember listening to the shows and they're like, all right, you know, this Hennigan kid can play. So. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, as, as, as a fan, man, to be honest, you know, it's, we go in with, you know, and Memphis is notoriously bad for this is you know, when things are really good, they forget how, you know, the, there's a learning curve sometimes. And mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, you step foot on the field and like me being a realist, I'm like, all right, there could be some learning curves that happen. I don't think we're going to lose this game. And I don't think, you know, Seth is going to have a bad game, but I want to see if this is something that is going to be able to propel us and be something steady that we can rely on for the remainder of the season. And man, I, you know, from that standpoint, you did absolutely that you, you, you went out there, you were poised, you looked good. You went out there, you know, with a, with a clue and, you know, you got things done. You commanded the, the offense. You did exactly, you know, from my vantage point of what I wanted to see, because I felt comfortable going into the next week going, Hey, we got a guy and he's going to be good. Um, you know, there was none of that, you know, anxiety, you know, that, you know, people talk about, well, what's next? You know, can we, are we going to be able to do something with this? Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, kudos to you, man, a lot of hard work paying off, dude. And, you know, when I, when I talk about hard work paying off, I mean, you, you were eligible to play, you know, despite injury, 11 games, you were the first true freshman to start a season opener in program history, man. You went on, yeah. Your first season to complete 235 of 393 pass passes for 3,322 yards, 25 touchdowns. You finished the season ranked 11th in the nation in passing yards per game with 302, 12th in total offense, 14th in passing yards per completion, 19 in completions per game, and 20th in, in, in passing yards, man. And I, I got to give you one of these for that. Take that for data because man those are like a true freshman going on the field against some of the teams that you did dude you 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 did it man you were an absolute badass man what a what a good good solid you know first freshman season and you know i i have to ask like were was there numbers in your head where you're like all right my goal is to be this or to do this you know once you solidified the starting role did you go all right my goal is to have this many passing yards, this many touchdowns, or was it, I'm just going to go out there and try to do my best and whatever happens, happens. Uh, I mean, yeah, most people would say they would have goals because it's good to set goals, obviously, but my goal was just to try and win every single game and win every single play 
uh, and execute it the way it's supposed to be because in my mind, if I executed every single play, then it would lead to wins, lead our team to success. Um, so I wasn't really ever thinking about statistics or, or accolades or anything like that. But, I mean, things just kind of ended up that way. You know, our offense kind of geared more toward the pass uh, by the end of the season. And we're kind of leaning on Calvin and myself and Sean Dykes and our receiving core uh, to throw it more. So, I mean, that's just how things worked out. Um, but, no, nah, I didn't really have any, have any statistical goals just besides winning. Well, you, you ended up leading all true freshman quarterbacks in the country in completions, attempts, yards, and touchdowns. Um, you know, you, you passed for, you know, over 3,000 yards. You broke Paxton Lynch's single season record for uh, passing yardage as a freshman. Um, 463 passing yards at Tulsa, the fourth most passing yards in Memphis history, man. When you – hear things like that and your name being brought up um with guys like Paxton Lynch who went on to be you know and you know a high caliber quarterback for the program you know do you think do you go man like I I can do something special here yeah I mean for sure I think uh coming to this program I knew to a certain degree what I was getting myself into um and I wanted to be what what's kind of happening right now like I feel like I'm on the road to where I want to be in the future and where I want to take our program and take myself um in my life but you know I just try and take things day by day and not really go too crazy or think about the future or anything like that or think about records being broken I would just try and you know play the game the way it's supposed to be played and just do my best to help our team win and yeah. What, what what would you say is your your favorite game or favorite moment in in last last season? Um, I mean, I'd probably say Mississippi State, or that's the one everyone was most excited about. But I mean, I guess for me personally, I might even say just Arkansas State, just because I felt like that was my coming out party. Like, like I had a good game in my eyes. Um, and like all my teammates and Coach Johns, the office coordinator at the time, they really like, they were like, okay, like, like I see you. Cause I had, I had a, like 400 yards that game, no interceptions. Uh, it was a good game for me. And that's when people kind of, they started respecting me more on the team and they're like, okay, let's do it. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take you back. I want you to listen. I got a, a, a clip for you. This is, my favorite moment of the season because it it made me a true believer in your abilities and the fact that I think that we got something special in you. Tigers have scored on their first two drives. Seth Hennigan, the true freshman, heaving it deep. It is caught. Oh, what a throw. Javon Ivory. So that was you throwing to Javon Ivory, but let me let me break it down for you because you, you you couldn't see the clip, you could just hear it. It's against Temple. Temple's rushing, I think, three or four guys, and they're all coming at you. It almost looked as though it was like a you know a, a screen or something because they, they were coming in free, and off your back foot, you throw it about sixty yards, and, and you hit Javon Ivory in stride. He catches it with one step before he runs out of the back of the end zone for a touchdown. And I thought to myself, that's one hell of a throw. That's a pressure pack throw. And if you can make that throw, I felt like, man, you, you could do anything. So, um, you know, just taking you back to that moment, like, and, and to be honest, I wanted to beat Temple more than probably more than any player on that field. Cause I felt like that was a game that you know, or a team that we owed a little something to. And I don't know if that was brought up, you know, prior to you guys playing them, but um, they, they needed to have a little something given to them. So, um, you know, great job there. But, you know, you guys end up, you know, finishing, you know, six and six. Um, would you say successful season, you know, middle of the pack, not expectation season? How do you grade a six and six season? Uh, middle of the pack, that's what I'd say. I mean, I've said this a couple of times, like there's just a couple of plays that could have altered our record very easily, like in each game or 
I mean, not the um, not the Houston game, but or the UCF game, but the other games that we played in, like ECU, the two point conversion, obviously that changes the game. Um, Tulsa, we missed a couple kicks, and uh, I had I had a bunch of turnovers, and then I'm trying to think the other games, but like, you know, oh yeah, Temple, we had a couple fumbles. So, I mean, every single game, like, offensively, we kicked ourselves. Um, so, it could have very easily been different, but mediocre, obviously. Six and six, unacceptable. So, yeah. you, you you mentioned – Jimmy mentions UCF, and, and I, I got I to gotta throw this little story out there. So, you know, I – obviously, living in Tampa, I'm going to go to Orlando to watch you guys play UCF anytime you're there. Um, and I'm going to go obviously to USF because it's in Tampa. Anytime you guys come pretty, uh, disappointed. You guys play UCF at home this year and you don't play USF at all. So like, what, what, what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to, you got to fly in. I made it to three Memphis games and I'm not the Memphis fan, homie. I, I hear you. I hear you. I, I was at Mississippi state and I agree with Seth that that one was fun because, you know, obviously I live in that, in that region and Mississippi State fans were bitter, and that made it so worth it, Daniel. Oh, they 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 just got to do better. I mean, I just... now now it was tough. It was tough, Seth, because what you don't know is we had had Will Rogers on like two weeks before that game. So like you know, we like to root for the guys that come on the show, but Daniel was like, nah, not against I, Memphis. I I told Will Rogers to his face. I said, if you think you're gonna go in. To our house and it's going to be easy for you you're 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 mistaken you're daniel mistaken. we never really addressed it we'll address it right here with seth he said that they were going to beat memphis and lsu because that was our teams and he didn't either we're gonna to have to talk oh. to him about it uh, maybe we'll bring him back i don't know <laughs> you know i i, I want to go back to ucf because like i'm i'm getting reports obviously you know prior to the game that you're not going to play um you know Obviously, we're going to have, you know, Peter in. He's going to do his thing. But I see you on the sideline, and I, I, my eyes might be fooling me, but you're on the sideline throwing darts to people. And I said, what is – there's nothing wrong with this guy. Why is he not playing? Put him in. Um, but obviously, I'm sure there was more to the injury and a lot of, you know, precaution going into it. But, um, you know, I, I was – I was a little disappointed when I didn't get to see you play, so I'll say that. So this year, UCF, you owe them a little something. Yep, for sure. Um, you know, obviously, you know, of of the losses this season, which which loss would you say was the most frustrating or the most disappointing or the, you know, obviously all losses are hard to take, but which one was the, was the toughest to swallow? Um, I, I would say Houston. Or, I mean, ECU, obviously, that's just kind of a heartbreaker. Like, um, we could have just kicked the extra point. You know, we missed the two-point conversion. That caused us to lose. Could have played it safe. You know, all these variables. But I would say the Houston game just because I played poorly. And uh, that, was my, that was my first game back off of the injury. I'm pretty sure. Uh, don't quote me on that. But uh, I missed a lot of throws in that game and uh didn't execute well like there was one play like it was a second down and like I got hit or something when I was scrambling up it was like a two-yard game and I like messed up my knee a little bit and the next play I throw a bad pass but like there's like no excuses to be doing that uh, especially at this level so Houston game I really uh I didn't like that game at all I played bad so that was in my opinion uh the worst loss me so you know you know talking about you know disappointment you know you guys finish six and six you're bowl eligible you get an invite to go to hawaii um you know pretty cool trip you know that that you get to go on you get to play out there um you know something that you know not a lot of teams can say that they were able to do um but the game you know doesn't happen is there you know what is that like? And, and how take me through like leading up to that decision being made is coach talking to you guys is the university just saying, this is how it's going to be. Or what, what was that lead up like? 
Um, I mean, we were practicing in the mornings because we practiced in the mornings. But um, so we had already practiced for the day. And so they're letting us out for a little bit before we had meetings uh, at night to go over the practices and prepare for the opponent, obviously. Um, and then we got a text and it was just like, we're having a meeting right now. It was like 12 uh, in the afternoon. And we're like, oh, what's happening? So then like, we're just all walking to the team meeting room uh, in Hawaii, in the hotel. And uh, we're like, obviously someone's gonna be on Twitter checking this stuff out. And then someone sees the uh, Hawaii Bowl is canceled. They have COVID, there's a COVID outbreak in Hawaii's football team or whatever. So that's obviously the speculation going into the team meeting room. And then, yeah, I mean, Coach Schofield just said um, the bowl was canceled. There's mixed reactions, obviously. Uh, I was I was sad. Um, the seniors, uh, they, they were kind of sad. Some people were happy. They were like, oh, it's a free free trip. We just get to relax, which I can, I can understand. You're in Hawaii, like, uh, live it up. But some people were, were there to, you know, play a game and win a game. Um, but so it, it was good to have a, a little free vacation, obviously. But uh, I was excited to play the game. So for that not to happen, it was – we put a lot of time into it because uh, the break before the game. So um, – but at the end of the day, it, whatever happened, happened. And then we got to relax, have fun uh, with our teammates in Hawaii. So that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, obviously. So I just I just enjoyed it. So yeah, Daniel, probably, go ahead. I was gonna say before you jump into that, let me ask you. You know, we're we're older. We complain about the new age and technology and social media. How much does it bother you that Silverfield didn't get to break the news himself? I mean, it. Um, I, I don't think anybody's ever going to be faster than. That's what I'm saying. Technology. And don't you hate that the coach doesn't get to talk to his players before they know? Like that's. You know, you're you were a college baseball coach. Don't you want to talk to your players first? I mean, obviously, yeah. Like I want the every big message to come from me first. Like yeah. it, it would suck to, you know, be checking Twitter or get a, a a notification and you go, Oh, well, is this true? Is this not true? And then, you know, there's more speculation than anything, you know, until you do finally hear that that confirming words from, you know from the guy, you know, um, or the coach, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a different age. Definitely kind of, you know, is, is disappointing in my eyes that the coach doesn't get the final say. Um, but yeah. you know, talking about, you know, coaches say, um, what is, um, coach Silverfield's message this off season been to you guys? Um, I mean, I guess one of his main, uh, points of emphasis would just be, that it's a new team, it's a new season. And then I don't know if he said it too much, but like in my mind, I just think that like we're so overlooked. Like I just see all these polls and I see all these things. I see all the back to the social media stuff. Like I see all these rankings and all this this nothingness. And like we're we're not in the mix. And like I take that personally. Um for our university, our team, and just, like, for myself, too. So, I mean, I just can't wait to, you know, put it on display because we had a good spring. Uh, both our new coordinators have done a great job, a, a great job uh, developing us and teaching us more intricacies of the game and uh, everything like that. Um, so I think we'll just be better all around and nobody expects us to do anything. So, I mean, I kind of – I love it. You know, so obviously new coordinators, uh, you know, new faces, you know, new schemes, new, you know, new formations, all kinds of probably new stuff. Um, but, you know, outside of that, going into this, you know, the off season and going into the upcoming season, what did you say was the one thing that Seth Hennigan needs to work on? to improve from last year? Um, well, the main thing I put in my notes is back shoulder throws, just on go balls on the outside, just throwing my back shoulders better. But uh, I mean, I also put third down efficiency and then red zone scoring touchdowns, not kicking field goals. So those are my three main things. 
But the top one on the board that I put is just being more accurate on my back shoulder balls, which uh, I feel like I did a good job of as the spring progressed. So just getting better every single every single day. I mean, that's that's the key. I mean, obviously, that's coach speak, you know, and, yeah. you know, you you grow you've grown up in a, in a coach's house. So, you know, coach speak. But I mean, it's it's really the truth that, you know, when coaches talk about, you know, just, you know, stay within yourself you know, get better every day, you know, control the things you can control, you know, focus on the little things, all of those things. I mean, you know, as simply put, they're, they're very simple things, but they're true. Um, you know, you got guys like, you know, Brady White's going to be on the sideline this year. He's spoken, you know, you know, he's on record speaking, you know, very highly of you. Um, what is it like having a guy that's been in your shoes, um, and help lead the program to the heights that it is now, um, being there to help guide you, be there as, you know, uh, that, that old sage that can give you wisdom, give you an advice. And it's not like this fluff and guy that's 20 years older than you. It's a guy that just recently stepped out of those shoes. Uh, yeah, it's been great just having him uh, around and still in our program because, uh, well, the first time I met him, was the my spring, my first spring before my freshman year. Um, and I just shook his hand and asked for a little bit of advice, um, just how to play the game. And then he ended up coming back for a little bit in the fall. Just, uh, I forgot what he did. He didn't, he couldn't really be around us too much, but I just, I got some advice from him. He was around uh, he, and I can look at him as like a friend and a coach. So like, I respect, I respect the hell out of him. But at the same time, he can still, like, make jokes and understands me, I guess I could say. He, he knows the position. Um, he's a great leader. So tapping him back will be great. And then more of a um, more of a coaching role will be good, too. So I can uh, ask him more questions. I think he can be hands-on on the field, too. I'm not really sure what his role is, to be honest. I think he might be with the receivers or something. But just having him around will be good for us. Um, good for our team just have a have someone to give advice and he knows the offense too so uh, he knows football so he'll be able to help everyone out yeah definitely very high IQ um, you know, yeah. when, in regards to football hell very high Q when it in regards to school I mean yeah he came on guy. here and uh, we you know we argued he was arguably our smartest guest Daniel did we not say like yeah he you know we would ask him questions and it was like you know he would you could see how analytical he was he would process it and then he would give you like a like a dissertation answer it was <laughs> unbelievable you know but um yeah i mean definitely a, a smart dude good mind and, and definitely an, an asset and a value value to the program and and to you yeah you know we you you, you look at you know guys like calvin austin you know that John Dykes, guys that are, are, are not necessarily going to be, you know, with the team this year. You got guys, you know, like Javon Ivory, you know, but, you know, outside of that name, give me a guy that nobody has heard of yet, but this time next season they will. Uh, Joe Skates, a transfer from Iowa State, is one of the top guys I'd say. And then Markel Jones, he played a little bit for us last year. Uh, came off a bad injury, I think his his freshman year, and he had a great spring. Uh, both of them did. So both those guys haven't played for us much. Uh, Joe hasn't played for us at all, but they came in, and I expect them to have big seasons this season. So what's the one game on on the the schedule that you got circled? Um. I'd say Houston. I was just. I knew that was coming after what you better. said about how you played. Yeah, I knew that was yeah. coming. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Houston or game one, Mississippi State, just trying to start it off the right way. So, but I mean, all of them at the end of the day, just trying to win them all, kind of attack them all with the same exact mindset. Don't think of one game bigger than the other. Cause I mean, last year, like once we won the Mississippi State game, everyone was like, oh, we're three and oh, we should be Mississippi State. Like, okay, like, we're about to do this thing. And then next thing you know, uh, you know, things happen the way they did. So, I mean, just attack every game the same. 
just don't think of one game higher than the other. Think of them all at the same level of importance, which in our lives would be the highest, or they should be, uh, because that's that's what we live for. One one week at a time, uh, one exactly. one one practice at a time, one game at a time, and then you know wherever you end up, you end up. Uh, exactly. You know, obviously, um, we titled you know this episode "Difference Maker" because you know every time we are listening to Memphis media, that's how they characterize you, a difference maker. Um, you know, would you consider yourself a difference maker um, or do you consider yourself just one piece of the puzzle that, you know, makes this thing work? I'd say difference maker for sure, just because I feel like I changed the outlook of the game for the offensive coordinator he can do whatever he wants with me. He can, and I'm just continuing to develop too. Like in my eyes, I'm a difference maker when it comes to everything in our program, because I try and lead by example in everything I do. I work hard in the weight room, which will just lead me to have different variations of success on the field, like in regards to running the ball and doing whatever I can to help our offense be successful and our team be successful. So, I mean, I consider myself a difference maker for sure. Yeah, you no doubt are. And I love that you said weight room. We're going to definitely end on that note to play this game because I love the weight room. <laughs> All right, so we got a game we play with every guest called This or That. Basically, we give you two options. You pick one or the other. The only rules are you can't say neither and you can't say both. You down to play? Yes, sir. All right, we're going to find out about this first one. I might cut you off depending on how you answer. Texas barbecue or Memphis barbecue? Texas barbecue. Oh Lord! All right, we're we're done here. Uh, it's <laughs> nice. Good luck this season, Seth. All right, uh, no, Seth, get give me a quick reason why. Because Memphis barbecue, uh, it's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like better. It's not moist. It's like it's dry. It's dry. There we go. Uh, 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 all right, I'll let I'll let I'll let that slide. And so, to be clear, as we go to these next questions, we have a different set of questions every season so you're the first one to get a bunch of these i don't know how they're gonna go we're just gonna see but i say that because this first one's interesting does the toilet paper roll belong rolling over or under seth over i agree no argument here all right would you rather have no company or bad company no company smart man what's a more exciting day for you christmas or your birthday christmas for sure all right would you rather go to any concert or any sporting event? Um, any sporting event. What's the sporting event you're going to, if you can pick any of them? I would go to the NBA Finals. Hey, he's still a basketball player at heart, Daniel. He did say the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah. Who Who was uh, – we had our, one of our last – couple guests said that they wanted to go to the nba finals yeah that's just, that's the spot i mean that is where all the famous people are at for sure all right so would you rather and this would be interesting based upon everything you've said so far in this episode would you rather go through intense pain for an hour or dull pain for an entire day uh, intense pain for an hour i knew he's gonna say that daniel he's a, he's a gamer man I'm, yeah. I'm sold more and more all right so last question and this is a hypothetical you know so this is down in the future would you rather have a second chance at love or a second chance of your football career? Um, I mean, I guess a second chance at my football career. <laughs> Forget them ladies. <laughs> That's right, baby. All so right. Much. Seth, dude, it's it's been a pleasure. Anything that you want to plug or promote before we let you roll? I'm good. Thank you, though. Well, I had a feeling you're going to say that. So I took the the, the privilege of, of throwing this out there. If you want to know more about Seth Hennigan, go over to Instagram, type in Seth.Hennigan, and you'll get the whole story. You'll get to see him, you know, at home doing what he does, just a normal guy, or you'll see him out there on the football field doing his thing. But more importantly, Seth, September 3rd, ESPNU, 6.30. You're going to Starkville, and you're going to take on Mississippi State Bulldogs. So everybody tune into that, man. Seth, we wish you nothing but the best. If there's anything we can do for you this season, please reach out to us, man. 
sir. Thank you. You got it. That's Seth Hennigan, everybody. We're going to take a break. We're going to plug those sponsors so we can pay the bills around here and keep these lights on. When we come back, we got some headlines. 